Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yeah, Def, what's going on? What's going on? How's your week been? Uh, my week has been okay. Uh, I had the school blues this week, and I just, you know, I wasn't feeling it. I was just like, I'm ready to graduate. I'm ready to be done with this. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how it was. But then toward the end of the week, uh, something made me start looking at job ads and people are already putting them out. And it just mm-hmm. so happened that one of the first ads I saw, like, described me to a T. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm going to get the job, but yeah. it, it made me feel good that it's like, it, it, at least I have one job to apply for this year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I get it. You know, when you're getting close to being done, you're just like, I'm ready to be out, you know. Um, but yeah, the, they start posting. I mean, it's it's, it's early to start posting now, um, but they do start, but most of them start coming like late July, early August. You'll start seeing a lot of the posts in between August and September. Okay. That's when the schools will be pushing them all out. Uh, but it's good that there's some out now and you already saw one. So that's, that's good, you know, a little motivation to, to keep finishing. To keep finishing. You know, you, know, you got to, at least if you give invited, you got to have something to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Like, ooh, I need to get, you know, a writing sample and all that. But what was, I think what was worrying me is that over these years, I hadn't saw very many job ads that fit, um, I guess, my research interests. So, like, I'm in education, but I'm also a sociologist. I have a master's degree. I almost had a PhD in sociology. Um, and so finding a job that kind of like speaks to both of those things is actually way more difficult than I expected. So, yeah, yeah. But what you will see is that you will be able to apply to a lot more jobs because yeah. because you're in that limbo and in, in between space where some sociology departments will consider you some education departments will consider you maybe even some political science depends. Um, you know what what you're what they're looking for specifically, but um, that definitely opens the market up for you. Where you'll have a lot more a lot more options than most. Let's hope so, because now I'm <laughs> tr- I'm trying to be the other professor on this podcast. You know, <laughs> <laughs> soon enough, soon enough. Not just professor uh, Ty, we actually that's what we should start calling you on here, Professor Ty. <laughs> professor Ty. <laughs> or yeah, kind of like Doctor Phil. Uh, Doctor Phil. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> Doctor Ty. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on but, with you? No, nah, this past week I was at a, um, I was at a conference um, in Villanova called the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Conference. Okay, and, um, I remember you mentioning that. Yeah, and you know it was. Uh, I, I have a lot of reservations about that thing <laughs> that I won't put it all out on air. But it's it, it's essentially this is the second year they're doing it, and it's been funded by companies like Kellogg's and now more recently Papa John's. Oh, interesting. Uh, which is already, <laughs> once they said Papa John's, everybody in the crowd was like, uh, what? <laughs> Just- <laughs> and then the, the person was trying to like clear it up and like, oh, they have new leadership. You know, they're trying to new do things and invest in this kind of stuff. We're like, yeah, okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of based off, seems to be based off like restorative justice, like uh, healing circles type thing and mm-hmm. um, using race and, um, uh, yeah, it's it's still in the new phases, but there's a lot that I wasn't feeling, you know, just, okay, everybody get back, you know, black folks and white folks get together, black folks, tell us about your, you know, trauma, uh, traumatizing events in your life, white, white folks listen, and now everybody's supposed to like kumbaya, and we're supposed to move past race, racism. Yeah. Like, Did y'all do any healing circles? We did a healing circle the first day. Um, it was about a three, four hour healing circle. And, uh, to, you know, they wanted to show us what it was like. And a lot of us left like, yeah, this is this ain't it. 
<laughs> they, I mean, I, they do that in restorative justice. Like that yeah. is a practice. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, you know, they just don't, I think the biggest issue with this whole thing is like, they're not trying to address anything systemically, mm-hmm. you know, the things that actually cause the trauma. Um, so it's like, okay, you have these sessions, they can be therapeutic, but then people are still going right back into the same environment and have, you know, can still be potentially re-traumatized. So you need to have a, a dual approach to it. And I think that was the biggest issue, but, you know, took some things away from it. Now we got to go report back to the university in the fall and try to see if we want to come up with a game plan to apply it, which we probably definitely won't be applying to healing circles, but maybe we'll figure something, our own twist to it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, but other than that, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into some old Lord news because we got a lot to talk about today when it gets to get to the politics. Hello. And welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening Oh Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say... Okay, well, let's get going. Uh, uh, So, you know, speaking of race and, you know, healing and all of that. So Adidas um, has been doing a good job of showing diversity in their ads. They have collaboration with none other than Beyonce, with Pharrell, um, Kanye West, but I don't know if he counts as diversity because, you know. <laughs> but anyway, although they have all this diversity uh, in their collaborations and in their ads, they have a diversity problem at their corporate offices. Mm. Um, there was a recent article that was published that said of the 1,700 employees at the Adidas headquarters in Portland, Less than 4.5% identify as African-American or as Black, Mm. more accurately. Uh, 78% identify as White. Now, you know, that isn't the issue per se, uh, but when you have those types of like racial composition, that's when it awkwardness starts to come around because some anonymous employees told uh, the Times that black employees, you know, they sometimes sit together in the cafeteria, but some of them were reportedly told by their white colleagues that it made them nervous when the black people sat together what? in the cafeteria yeah. oh. and that doing so could hurt their chances of getting a promotion if it seemed as if they weren't trying to fit the quote Adidas mold. Wow. Wow. So, so black folk can't even sit together at lunch without scaring, <laughs> scaring white folk. Oh, uh, come on, people. I don't know. These people really hear themselves, man. <laughs> Like it scares them. It scares them. That's the language they use. I think that people have to like move beyond like their norms. It is so normal for anyone to walk anywhere and see a table full of white people. Why is that? There's nothing scary about that to me. Why is it scary to see like a table full of black people together? Like, (laughs) just come join. Actually, actually, white folks sitting together is scary to me. Oh my God. Only if we're in like a get out situation. (laughs) (laughs) If I walk into a room and I see all these white folks just sitting together, I might be a little worried. You know, that's so funny. funny. But th- there's nothing, you know, we're not plotting, you know, we're just enjoying lunch and we probably saw a familiar face and then they saw a familiar face and then they saw a familiar face. Yeah. So, you know, is that that's really all it is. If you have an that's issue good. with it, come join. Come actually, join. See what it's about. Actually, get out of the norm. Because one thing, I am accustomed to being the only black person at the table, the only black person in the room. I feel like other race or the majority race should get accustomed to knowing what it feels like to be the minority. So join the table. Maybe you'll learn something. Yeah, join the table. Maybe you'll learn something. I mean, that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Actually, I just had a conversation with, you know, the people, it was like seven of us <clears throat> from my university, some administration and all stuff. We're trying to figure out some of the issues. And that's actually one of the things I talked about, about even in higher ed, the fact that, they bring in, you know, faculty of color like myself, 
And then, you know, I'll see, you know, I just finished up my fourth year. And so I'll run into various faculty admin. They'd be like, dang, Terrell, you know, where you be at? Haven't seen you around. I'd be like, I had to tell them, like, yo, that's offensive. You know why? Because I'm very active on campus. Mm -hmm. I put on tons of events with students and myself, bringing in tons of people and uh, just point uh straightforward white folks just don't show up to it you yeah. know what i'm saying it just is like a black space so they're not including themselves it's like okay i'm here my presence is felt the students know i'm here i'm putting on events i'm being active like i should be but you all are acting like i'm hiding in the corner and not being visible and so that's the same thing it's like put yourself in introduce yourself sit at the table come to the events um and then you'll probably feel less scary you know when you see them or around mm -hmm. that's just crazy but it's like that proactive approach it's mm -hmm. like okay we're here but if you want us to feel really a part of the community you have to show up to events you have to sit at the lunch tables with us yeah. get to know us a little bit more yes instead of feeling uncomfortable because uh that's our life every day, yeah. <laughs> you know? every day. when i'm in faculty meetings when i'm at faculty and i'm the only black person there that's what i experience so when i want to do things that's you know, black centered, then, okay, you come into my world a little bit. And then maybe we both can feel more mutually comfortable, but they always just want to put it on the black folk to, to, to not sit with our folk and go sit with y'all when we deal with y'all every day. Come on now. See, that's that truth <laughs> from racial healing. We got to, we got to cross boundaries. Man. We <laughs> we be one cross. party crossing boundaries. You know? <laughs> gotta, exactly. Both gotta, parties. Gotta be a two way street as they say, but, that, but that's funny, man. Mm -hmm. and, you know, even me personally, when I think about, when I'm in events or, you know, I, the, it's just, to be honest, a lot of times I just go with the black folk is because at the white folk tables, I just don't have a lot to talk about. You know, it's not a lot of mutually shared interests that I have a lot of the times um, as far as the music they're listening to, if they're talking about TV shows and stuff like that. It's just like uh, I always f I find it difficult for my way to find get into the conversation because it's just a lot of the things culturally in some cases that we just I don't talk about, so I don't know what they be talking about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then when I see my own folk and then we get down, we talk about whatever it is, you know, whether it's memes from debates, like, like Booker trying to speak Spanish and stuff like oh that. Oh my God. <laughs> it just hits a little different when I'm around people, you know, that understand what I'm talking about. But, but anyway, yeah, that's funny. All right. Okay. So this second story is kind of wild. Um, a pregnant woman, who was shot in the stomach and lost her baby, was recently indicted by a grand jury on manslaughter charges for killing her baby. But she didn't shoot the gun. Yeah, she got shot. Yeah, she got shot. She lost a baby, but the person who shot her uh, was not indicted. Um, you know, a jury didn't, you know, charge them uh but the the pregnant woman or formerly pregnant woman was charged what do you think yeah. about that i think that's wild um I, I don't even know who sits like on the in these legal positions and is like we have to indict this woman let's charge this woman for manslaughter um like that's wild man like she just lost her baby you know what i'm saying and now you want to indict her for for she didn't shoot herself. She didn't intentionally do it. She got shot. They said she reading, initiated the dispute. The, yeah, that's and and that's what that's not enough. People get into fights all the time, disagreements, <laughs> uh, and that doesn't mean like you know she should get shot and and then lose the baby and then all top of that be indicted. I mean that's just so cruel, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. On there's no no other word about it. It's just wrong. It should not be the case. Uh, yeah. So it's because it, for me, that's weird. It's kind of like, you know, we talked about like staying your ground and things like that. The if you're defending yourself, the force that you use should kind of match the force that the other people like you shouldn't be able to like shoot somebody over a shove, like like things like that. And so, of course, I don't know how well the fight got, but it, it just seems this all just seems very strange to me. And people have been uh, kind of equating this to uh, the anti-abortion thing and saying, like, you know, could this be the case for women who, you know, purposely have, you know, abortions? You know, they they get indicted. People just saw this as a slippery slope. Oh, it really is. It really is, especially in these states where they're pushing for things like this. And this is the kind of thing the cases are trying to make. Um and, and again, it's just it's just so, um, yeah, I guess 
you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy involved in some ways because it's like, you know, I'm seeing a lot of memes and discussions about these states that are really pushing conservatives, pushing for um, these anti-abortion laws, but then ignoring what's going on with like the children and immigration and these camps and the health risk and the deaths that are happening. Um, so it's like, why don't you care about all life, right? Mm-hmm. When it comes to, to to babies and children, um, it, it's just it's just not uh, it's just not you know being um, applied fairly and equally. So yeah, yeah. And yes, I actually saw a a meme that was like, uh, just pretend for a minute that there were, you know, hundreds of dogs in cages, you know, not being fed, not being, you know, experiencing this horrible treatment. Now, just picture them as Latino children. Like, yeah. People would be outraged if dogs were being treated how humans were being treated. Yeah, it's like white folk love them dogs, man. <laughs> so you put any imagery out there like that, I mean, it is going all the way to the Supreme Court immediately and changes will be made. Uh, you know, we even see what happened with Michael Vick and cases like that. Like, it is a serious thing to them. So, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of truth to that, you know, and that's a, definitely a running joke around with me and my black friends and colleagues, how how much white people love their dogs. Um, so, so, yeah, switching that up. You know, and I think the sad truth is, I think the dogs will get a lot more attention. Yeah. Dog lives matter. <laughs> dogs lives matter. Uh, but speaking speaking of the border situation, uh, do you remember that GoFundMe campaign to build a border wall? Yep. Mm-hmm. OK, well, a man allowed a private group to, you know, use some of those funds to build a portion of the wall on his Sunland Park, uh, New Mexico property. Well, that guy is being charged with illegally constructing without a permit and can now face jail time because although they raised the money, they did not secure the proper permit. That's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) So he thought he could just like bail without getting, you know, going to town hall and getting it approved, huh? Yeah. And so um, he actually failed to appear at his first court hearing last week. Uh, and the city reportedly plans to file a criminal summons if he misses the next hearing. So when you try to be slick and discriminatory, sometimes it just bites you in the eye. <laughs> Okay, and so for my for, uh, final Oh Lord Nude story, um, so you remember the major tax cut that companies and the 1% received from Trump? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, Walmart specifically got a $2.2 billion tax cut. Crazy, right? Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, however, remember we were told trickle down that these tax cut, tax cuts were gonna go down to businesses who were gonna hire people who were gonna raise you know wages and all that stuff. Well, come to find out, of course, that's not true. Walmart is about to lay off workers at its corporate office near the Charlotte Airport. It plans to lay off. 570 employees um, despite si- despite signing a 12 year lease. They only made it four years instead of a 12 year lease. And they're getting all these tax cuts, but I guess they still don't have enough profit. So they have to wow. <laughs> lay people off. Yeah, I think they have enough profit. They just don't want to share the wealth <laughs> is what's clearly happening. That's wild though. Yeah, um, not not happy about that. Like, I, I will be honest. I'm trying to do better and stop shopping there because they're just not socially responsible, you know? Yeah. Their, yeah. Uh, their business practices are a major reason that so many people have to use uh, social welfare services because they don't offer health insurance. They don't offer this. So it's just kind of like, mm, I, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I, I want to do better. My pockets, though, they be saying something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Walmart, um, you know, I rarely, I rarely shop there. Um, and that's one of the reasons why. Now, I could say that, you know, I now I'm privileged enough not to go when I was in grad school and stuff like that. That was definitely a place I, I went to a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but definitely I told myself, you know, once I got, you know, started making the real monies and stuff, I was like, I'm going I'm to go. 
go elsewhere, which I have. But yeah, they do. Their business practices aren't uh, the best. You know, they're not this happy, good place as mo- as they would like to portray themselves to be. And this is the whole thing about the whole Trump tax situation is that, oh, we're going to give these companies tax breaks so that way they can build more jobs. And we see that Walmart is doing the exact opposite, mm-hmm. getting these tax breaks and not giving anybody jobs. Even people like Amazon, which are trying to automate more jobs and take bodies out of their plants and stuff like that with these billions of dollars tax breaks. So we knew this was going to happen, you know, and uh, the funny thing is not the funny thing, but I think a lot of people who are voted for Trump probably work in a lot of these types of jobs mm-hmm. and, uh, are to, are going to actually start feeling this like, yo, I thought we were supposed to get more jobs and get raises or whatever. And now they're getting like, you know, fired or, or shut out laid off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's sad. But, you know, my finishing up the old Lord news segment, I guess it can move over to a company that, you know, makes it really hard for people to hate. <laughs> and, this, and this company is Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, although, you know, even people, even they with their politics, people just can't seem to not stop being able to eat that chicken and those mm-hmm. biscuits. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they added another reason for people to continue to go there because one of the reputations of Chick-fil-A is the fact that their employees are some of the best employees around. Very yeah. friendly, go over over and above and over the top. And so recently there was um, a story at a uh, Chick-fil-A in Atlanta that continued that legacy of Chick-fil-A, of great, having great employees. <laughs> and essentially what happened was that uh, a Chick-fil-A employee named Logan Simmons, this video of him actually jumping through the drive through window to save a choking boy. Six year old boy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he saw the boy was choking from the window in the car. He jumps out the window and then saves the little boy's life at Chick fil A. So we got to give a round of applause, a round of applause to Logan Simmons at Chick fil A for doing the right thing and yeah. saving lives. <laughs> yeah, that's the. It's, it's so hard because it's kind of like they have, or at least the CEO has these like messed up views. But, you know, thinking about their reaction after the Pulse uh, shooting and how they opened up on a Sunday to feed people and how their employees like go out of their way, it's kind of like, like, yo, like, how do I even interpret this business? (laughs) (laughs) And that's another one that because I do have very close friends that are LGBTQI, you know, it's something to where, like, I, you know, I try to be principled, you know, as much as I love that chicken and lemonade, you know, I try to, you know, hold off. I will admit, so I pay my research respondents uh, for talking to me and the students in particular. Yo, all they asked for were Chick-fil-A gift cards. And it's just kind of <laughs> like, yeah, what do I do? <laughs> um, but what's crazy is all my LGBTQI friends, except for one, are like, I want some Chick-fil-A. I, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what to do with that. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a tough, <laughs> it's a tough call. And I guess we're all still figuring it out together. Um, but, you know, when you see things like this, and like you said, even after the post shooting, open it up. Um, it just it's just not clear. I mean, I guess that's a good sign, right? Mm-hmm. And everything is not always black and white, right? Um, and we talk about, especially in this day and age of living cancel culture, uh, you know, I think, you know, they make a good case of just having a conversation and being a little more nuanced than, uh, you know, what we typically like to see or, or have these conversations. So, yeah. We'll and I, I, so... <laughs> You know how people, they have their religious beliefs and, you know, whether they're like misinterpreting the Bible or like cherry picking, it's kind of like we do talk about we want people's beliefs or actions to line up with their beliefs. And, you know, I can't, I don't know about like corporate donations and stuff like that, but when we see them in the community, it em- well, the employees embody what you would want to see in believers. Like I've never had a bad experience there. So it's just kind of like, okay, we need to change some mindsets because if you have it in your heart to be uh, a company that's like socially responsible or thoughtful in some ways, that, that means there's something in you that, you know, we could, we could, you know, turn you into a, like a, a true social justice warrior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Very true. And kind of just gave me a quick thought, too, about um, a story I heard last week. Um, Because, you know, Andre Iguodala, who's on um, The Warriors, right? Mm -hmm. He recently was on a Breakfast Club because he has a book that was just recently released. And they asked him a question about Mark Jackson. Um, And Mark Jackson was the coach of the Golden State Warriors before Steve Kerr took over. So he pretty much assembled this team. And then once they got to peak performance... They fired him and then gave it to Steve Kerr, which there was a lot of like people like, what is going on? Like this man, this black man put this team together. Now you gave it to this white man. And now all of a sudden he has a super team and is winning championships and is getting all the credit for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say that Steve Kerr is a terrible coach, but it does question when, you know, you didn't have to actually build a team from scratch like Mark Jackson did. Mm -hmm. So they were asking him, why do they think Mark Jackson got fired? And Nigga Dollar pretty much said that he believed because it's not only did he get fired, but he's pretty much been blackballed out the league because he's a really good coach. And it's all. All these other, you know, good coaching jobs and all this other kind of stuff. And he's never been considered. Um, and so people would find that very weird uh, because he's a good coach. And like, so he does a lot of the commentating with um, Van Gundy when you listen to a lot of the games and stuff, especially the big games, mm-hmm. Mark, Mark Jackson and Van Gundy. Um, and so what Igudala was saying is that he believes that Mark Jackson got blackballed because of his uh, Christian beliefs. Um, mm. Apparently during the season and during like during the games, he would host like a, every Wednesday night at like 7 p.m. He would have like like prayer gatherings and like sermons and stuff like that. Completely voluntary. He would just be like, anybody wants to come, you know, in the course way after practice, the facilities are closed. He's like, if you want to come and just, you know, fellowship together, you can come. Uh, but one of the things that rubbed, Uh, the people the wrong way, especially because Golden State is located in San Francisco, is that, and this is where it gets kind of interesting, he did not, you know, support or really believe in in gay marriage, right? Mm. Um, But the approach was like, that was, he's, uh, Iguodala said like, that was his belief, but he never pushed that on anybody, right? It was just like, like, you know, I don't believe it, but I respect people that do it. I don't hold anything against you. You know, we still work together. We can still fellowship together, et cetera. He was just saying that if, you know, if he had the vote, like, you know, he just would not support it in that fashion. Um, And so this is why Iguodala felt that, you know, he got blackballed because of San Francisco being, you know, Mm -hmm. probably one of the pride capitals of the country. And of course, him leading that team just wasn't going to sit well. And then it kind of, you know, had this reverberation throughout the league. Um, So Mm -hmm. it begs the question of, can you have these beliefs and be in these positions and not, uh, I don't know, act upon them, you know, because you felt like they're your religious beliefs, how we conservatives try to give that to all these other businesses, right? Um, how they How they can practice and stuff like that. And still, you know, do your job and do it very well without it affecting your job or affecting your relationship with people. But because that's something you believe in. It, it was it was an interesting conversation. But anyway, this is what they said happened behind closed doors, which eventually kind of got him blackballed from the league because they don't want him with that kind of representation. Yeah. Um, but then the league also has racist owners and races, all these other racist people. <laughs> as we certain. talked about before, the Toronto's GM, right, uh, mm-hmm. couldn't even get in after his team won a championship because they wanted to see his paperwork. Yeah. Yeah, that that raises like we are all complicated human beings, <laughs> and you know I don't want to like excuse because it's you know gay marriage is not for you to believe in. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, but it's I I don't know when the actions show compassion, but the beliefs because we all have beliefs. We might not all. Uh, voice them we have beliefs about certain things that you know people might find controversial and it's kind of like is having those beliefs is not they're not okay but is it different to have those beliefs but still act like a decent human being versus having those beliefs but actively uh trying to like um I, I don't know. Actually yeah, no, it's to, tough. It's yeah. tough. Yeah, I mean, you know, I get it. You know, I get what happened and and why he's not there. But, you know, just like it does just complicate the questions a little bit more of, of what kind of conversations or what can we tolerate? Because at the end of the day, in this country, whether we like it or not, whether people who are belief system or not, they're going to people are going to have different beliefs. You know, mm-hmm. um, even me just being in academia, there are people <laughs> sitting in these faculty meetings who say some of the wildest things, you know, who are from, you know, different walks of life and different departments and, and fields and their beliefs on students in certain situations. We'd be like, what? 
you know, what the hell is going on here? How could you believe this? Mm -hmm. Uh, But yet I still have to work with them, right? Still be in the same space as them. Um, And so just can we allow that, you know, and and academia is different because it's kind of expected, but can we allow that in many other forms of employment too? We don't know, but I just thought it was interesting to bring up since you mentioned that it was on my mind. Um, Well, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it actually kind of gets us into the debates because one question that's kind of been circulating is will black people vote for Pete Buttigieg given his given that you know he is married to another man and so people have been asking that and just you know that kind of gets into our topic for today which is discussing these debates yes the debates debate season um so i i you know i know some of you were following us <clears throat> we were live tweeting excuse i didn't get to live tweet until about an hour into the debates because these dang on workshop these the longest days um so i was getting in later way later than i expected uh, but we were live tweeting uh, for the majority of them. And, uh, you know, overall, let's let's just, I guess, go into what are your overall feelings of both debates? Um, I feel like the first debate to me had a little bit more substance. I felt like people were on task a little bit more. Uh, but the second debate was more, I guess, lively in the sense that uh, it was a lot going on. People cross-talking, uh, you know, people kind of going in on each other mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So the second debate was a little bit more entertaining, but I feel like I maybe uh, stepped away from the first debate actually kind of surprised by a candidate and wanting to know more and I, I didn't necessarily feel that way at the second debate although I felt like you know people performed well in the second debate I just I didn't feel the same way yeah yeah I, I know definitely I mean the second debate was definitely more electric I guess you want to use that word uh and like I said I don't know it really it bothers me when people just disregard the moderators and they just keep going and they just over talking and going over the time. I don't know. That really just frustrates me. You know, it's like mm-hmm. have some just being in, in bounds a little bit and just stick with the program, especially with 10 people. Let everybody t- speak. It's different when it'll be just down to two or three folk. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. But when it's 10 people, say what you got to say. Let's keep moving on. I feel like it was getting a little disrespectful at times. Uh, but yeah, the first debate was. Uh, more, I guess, civil, if you will, in some capacity. Mm-hmm. And they definitely stayed on task. Um, but I also think even when we kind of addressed this last week, who was in both debates, um, it was just like that. the lineup of the first debate. It wasn't as many of the the top folks that have been in a lot of headlines, probably just outside of like Elizabeth Warren. Um, everybody else was trying to find and make a name for themselves. So I think they really just wanted to get their policy viewpoints out there and stuff like that. Whereas people like Biden and, and Sanders and, and Harris, you know, we kind of get a good sense of what they're about. And so it was a little bit more. Um, so it was a good chance to learn about more people in the first debate than it was in the second one. But uh, but yeah, overall, I guess we can start getting into some. Let's start with, I guess let's take it debate by debate. Let's start with the first debate. Um, and as you said, you know, you alluded to somebody standing out to you in the first one where you take some of the specific things you noticed and liked or didn't like in the first debate. Um, One thing I did like is I felt like there was some substance to, you know, what people were saying. I was actually very surprised by Castro. Um, he kind of stood out to me um, in a good way. I, you know, like that line he said to Beto, like, you know, maybe you should do your homework or something to, you know, that extent. Um, and I really, so when he talked about immigration, he talked about getting to the root causes of why people wanting to leave their country and come here. And if we're being honest with ourselves, the U.S. has a hand in in some of that. And I kind of like that. You know, I want to welcome people, but I do also, I want to fix, you know, places that are not working for citizens to where they would literally risk their lives to leave there. So, you know, I kind of appreciated that insight. Um, I thought the raise your hand questions were were really interesting. And it was only Elizabeth Warren and um, boy, who else raised their hand to say they would give up their. It was I think it was Elizabeth Warren and somebody I think it was two people. 
I yeah, it was two who... people. I can't remember the other person. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was a, you know, interesting question that they, you know, moved over to the debate number two. But, um, you know, I I liked Warren, I, but I liked her before I even went into the debate. So, hey. It was but I, I did and Warren, Astro. yeah, the only yeah. two people who raised their hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I agree. Um, you know, last week when we talked about it and I was kind of feeling like who was my going to be my sleepers for each debate, uh, Castro was definitely one of the per- people I think people were going to uh, start, you know, like, oh, who is this? You know, who what's he it? talking about? Yeah. Um, and I think he successfully achieved getting a little bit more attention on himself, um, staying poised, uh, you know, hitting the right points, discussing the right thing. So I think he... Um, I'll get to that in a second. But, yeah, I think he definitely made it right now, a good name for herself. Warren, you know, I think she did what she was going to do. I, I knew she was going to stand out because, again, she was already the kind of the only big timer mm-hmm. in that uh, in that first debate. So, yeah, that she was going to handle her. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know if she if she was in the second night, it would have looked a little different, you know, um, how they were approaching issues. And like I said, being a little bit more electric. Um, but that lineup definitely played in her hand. But she won't be in that lineup. Uh, for for too much longer at all, but so I knew she was gonna do it. But yeah, Castro he did a good job, and I think he really uh, exposed Beto. You know, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he did. I mean, people like Beto, and from both of them being uh, representatives in Texas in their own ways, um, you know, he just destroyed Beto. Uh, it's just this is what it boils down to. I know Beto tried to come out, you know, speak the Spanish, speak Spanish. <laughs> Yeah, that my I like I they somebody called it hispandering, uh, because they were pandering. Although Hispanic people technically don't, you know, use that if you're yeah. in a more woke woke crowd. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just and so it would okay. I guess you could say that was cool. But to me, why did it sound like Cory Booker was speaking like a Slavic language or something? <laughs> like it did not. His accent is atrocious, man. Yeah, that that was not good. Corey should have stood away from it. Yeah, he should. Because you've seen the meme of him how he was looking at Beto and he was doing it, and that was hilarious. Everybody was just going in. Uh, Maybe he had it in the stash because he was planning on doing it. Some people think that during the break, he uh, had somebody like tell him what to say uh, yeah. really quickly and 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 if you and from your approach how he said it you know that is probably the more because it didn't seem like it was if you had time to practice it would have been smoother and better yeah it, <laughs> just, it was so it sounds so forced to me yes. like it was something that he memorized and not that he and I mean I don't know he might speak Spanish but it didn't sound like the way a Spanish speaker like even if you aren't like even if Spanish isn't your first language there's a way to speak spanish like i don't know and it just, his his just didn't sound right i did think it was interesting that castro really wasn't doing all that like he slipped in like a little little bit of spanish at the end it was just like it was so quick though but he yeah. wasn't even doing all of that and he's latino yeah no he's definitely um you know when a lot of the articles talking about the winners and losers of of the democratic debates and he's definitely up there as, as being one of the winners getting more attention poll numbers going up a little bit because he they say he had like less than one percent yeah like that, mm-hmm. which i was actually shocked that i didn't know he was like that low um but i think and you know he he was a part of he was um working for hud with the obama administration mm-hmm. so he has those ties that will help help him as well with, which will not just only help somebody like a biden um who has those ties, but he was in that administration handpicked by Obama, had Obama support. And so now coming up there as being, um, you know, another man of color, uh, I think, I think again, he's going to take people's attention. So, so I guess out of the first debate, um, cause I was, what was the lineup? I don't know if I have everybody in the lineup from me. Who do you think is going to move on? I don't even know how they're going to like, how they're going to do it. Who moves on, who doesn't, but who do you think is not going to move on and who you think is moving on to the next? Well, so that that's interesting. Pretty much all of the people in the first two debates are eligible for the second debate. Um, because the way the rules work for the debates, you have to have like, um, either a certain percentage across Uh, like three polls or you have to have like so many unique individual like donors. So it's the uh, threshold to be eligible for the first and second debates were kind of low. Um, And pretty much everybody that 
was in the first debate is eligible for the second. I feel like they should find a way to cut that number down. But right now, uh, there'll probably be, you know, 20 people in that second debate. However, as of now, only eight people qualify for the third debate. Mm. Um, And those people are, I I have it somewhere, uh, Biden, Sanders, Warren, Harris, Buttigieg, O'Rourke, interesting, Klobuchar and Booker. Um, So, you know, if you did not hear the name of somebody that you're interested in uh, and you would like to see them on the debate stage, one way that you could help is by just donating a dollar to their campaign, because for the third debate, they need one hundred and thirty thousand unique donors to their campaign. And that's kind of like the way you become eligible through like grassroots participation. So for instance, I would like to see Castro in that final debate. So I did, you know, I gave a little $5. I ain't got a lot of money. (laughs) I did just because I want to hear more. So it's not saying that you endorse, but if you want to hear more from them, you know, you, I don't necessarily feel like you will hear more in the second debate if it's going to be another 20 people. But it's kind of like if we can narrow it down and, you know, maybe get it to like 10 because I want to see Castro in that lineup. But only eight people qualify for the third one right now. Okay, okay, that's good. That's good to know. Um, Yeah, I think I think Castro should be there for sure. Everybody else uh, from that debate. I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I want to hear from you. You don't want Mary Williamson there? <laughs> Man, yo, we'll get to her in a second. She was in that second debate. <laughs> uh, but, you know, finishing off the first debate, I guess, uh, uh, you know, Bill de Blasio, he keeps talking about his black son and understanding, uh, uh, you know, police brutality. He was getting ripped a little bit on social media for that yeah. as well. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard <clears throat> was, you know, interesting. Hit or miss. I was interested to see how she was going to play out. I know she, I think she was, I think I saw some, she was like the most Googled or something like that after the debate, mm. um, uh, which wouldn't, didn't surprise me because I know a lot of people didn't know about her and seeing that she was also a woman of color up there, uh, people probably like, oh, who's this? And trying to figure out, you know, her military experience had her, but she didn't really, she, her biggest uh, critique has been her previous stances on um, the LGBTQI communities mm. uh, and they asked her that and she didn't really give a good response to that as well um, I can't remember exactly what she said but it was kind of just like you know it was my past I grew up in a conservative family and you know you kind of learn as you go but it wasn't the thing is is it wasn't too far long ago because she's pretty young you know what I'm saying when she had these views mm-hmm. um, so that that probably didn't bode well as well for her. Um, and I'm trying to think anything else from that first debate. Oh, uh, wasn't Ensley in the first debate? And he was like, um, I'm the only person, only candidate up here who's passed legislation for women's rights. And uh, Klobuchar was like, yeah. uh, do like you actually have some women up here that have, you know, Fall pretty hard for women's life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was not a line he should have said when you're up here with three women. Um, uh, he was wilding for that one. And that was, yeah. But yeah, I doubt we'll see him moving forward. I doubt we'll see the uh, De Blasio's up in there because he's New York, but mm, let's see Tim Ryan. But his polling not. is fairly low, De yeah. Blasio's. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, Beto, you, I guess you said he already can make it, which is interesting because of the funds he has. So I guess we'll see him for at least two or three more rounds. Uh, yeah. One or two I more think rounds. it's because people, they had high expectations um, because of what happened, you know, during his like Senate race and stuff like that. So I feel like in the beginning, before he opened his mouth, people had a lot of high expectations for him. And it's just kind of like, but then he opened his mouth and they're like, oh, <laughs> Oh, and Booker's still on the fence too. He's like, you know, uh, he. I mean, he hit his points, but it's like, I don't know if I count him as a winner or loser. He's just like still just there, you know. They did say that he had decent like uh, fundraising and and stuff like that um, afterwards. You know, he he definitely wasn't a loser, but you know, he but he's already in a third debate, so. Yeah. And, you know, what I, what I kind of am noticing about Booker, which I don't know if I'm too much of a fan of, is his how he discusses Newark 
in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, somebody just died. I don't know if anybody else has in this, you know, shot down my block and, you know, the vine and this. I'm like, bro, like. In my one, hood. <laughs> yes. Like how you're painting the picture of Nork is not good, right? Because that's almost a dominant narrative, one. And then two, you were the mayor of that very place. So also sends a message like, what did you do to change this place <laughs> if it's still so bad and you live in there? You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's so, it sounds the way an outsider to our culture would describe that city. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It didn't sound like an insider's perspective. It was I don't know. He was like, he was selling something with that. Like, is, are you trying to show us that you down or something? I don't know. I know no other candidate like lives, you know, in the type of neighborhood <laughs> that I live in. Like, dude, I'm like, stop bro. it. Uh, first of all, you said you was living in somebody's basement in D.C. You was written out <laughs> since you became a senator. So, but now all of a sudden you just living in Newark every night on these dangerous streets. Come like, bro, like, uh, I don't like that. And I'm sure people in Newark are not too fond of that. Uh, you know, how they trying to env- have people envision their community. Mm-hmm. Um, you should, I think a better approach is to uplift those communities and show, you know, how crime has gone down, the good things they're doing. Maybe if you were a part of it, maybe not, but using those scare tactics, like pretty much saying like, yo, you, you know what, you know what blocks I'm from, man, you know, in hood I live in, mm-hmm. nobody else up here. He actually like said that and he had to like stop himself. Like nobody else is living yeah. where I live. <laughs> Like, relax, Booker, man, because you're not even really living in them streets, too, if you ask the people in Newark. Um, I would say um, after that first debate, Pete, uh, Mayor Pete, as they call him, he was in the top three uh, people in terms of who received uh, the most Twitter followers after the, the debate. Mm, good job, yeah. Uh huh. But it was interesting because I saw this article um, because, as I mentioned, people have been asking, will Black people who are so homophobic vote for him. Uh, And a homosexual man, black man, wrote an article and was like, if I don't vote for him or black people don't vote for him, it won't be because of homophobia. It'll be because his city is a mess and he hasn't done anything, you know, to help the black residents there. And like, he's currently dealing with this officer involved shooting, you know, of a black person. So it's just kind of like, don't blame it on like homophobia. If he doesn't get the black vote, it it might just be because um, he hasn't talked to black people directly until he actually needed us. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there was um, a bunch of videos going around that kind of went viral of, like, protesters going in on him, black protesters, about that recent shooting that was happening in South Bend. And, um, you know, it's just, you can't, there's some things you can't hide, you know, if you, uh, initially, before this stuff started happening, he uh, kept putting in his narrative that he's, like, his community is, you know, has a lot of people of color and they and they love him and he does great things. And then if they really loved you, you wouldn't have this kind of response when these issues happen, mm-hmm. you know. And and so now it's not, I know probably not the ideal time for him now. It's kind of stuff, but it's good that it's coming out now because he's probably going to have to address it if he wants to move forward yeah. um, in those ways. But, yeah, I think I think that person who wrote that the op-ed was right. Like, it's not. I don't think we're really black folks aren't really basing. I don't even know we have enough of the kind of luxury privilege to be like, oh, well, he's gay. You know, you know <laughs> oh, no, like yeah. that's the biggest concern. Like, nah, we looking in for a lot of other things before, you know, your, your sexuality. Yeah. Um, oh, and I misspoke. He was on night two, not night one. Yeah, night two. But yeah, we can, you know what I'm saying? We start talking about night two as well, because as we said, that was, that was pretty interesting. A lot of the, the bigger names were there. Um, and, and, you know, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, et cetera. And, um, you know, I guess my initial thoughts, um, as we kind of already generally talked about it, but I guess getting more specifically is, you know, again, uh, Kamala, man, she uh, she did well. You mm-hmm. know, um, I cannot knock her. She did well. She held her own. Um, she hit her point. She she stood out. I think she was definitely the, the biggest standout of that night. I'm still wrestling personally just – you know, my support for her. I'm not saying I can't support her or I won't. It's just like 
I'm just not fully there yet. I'm still, you know, dissecting a little bit more. I guess a healthy dose of skepticism moving forward. Uh, but I can't knock her. Got to give credit where credit is due. You know, I think she did her thing uh, in that debate with a lot of the other big names. She stood out the most. Yeah. Um, so my reaction to that is with uh, Senator Harris, I was impressed, but I wasn't surprised. Like we've seen, you know, videos of her, you know, holding her own, like being like no nonsense and like Senate hearings and stuff like that. We've seen that. Uh, so I was just like, I, I wouldn't have expected, you know, anything different. I feel like she did try to pull at, you know, some heartstrings with her, you know, personal stories. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't surprised overall, but uh, I thought it was interesting. So it's kind of like, I saw this meme where it was like, Yo, it was like uh, Kamala Harris to Joe Biden. You know, you're a racist. Joe Biden to, to Kamala Harris. You're the cops. Because it was kind of like, he was like, well, I was a public defender while you were out there. Yeah. Black people. No, just say, he didn't say that, but he like, well, yeah. that. But it, it's just kind of like, you know, ain't nobody out. Ain't nobody perfect out here in these streets. And in the same way that you know, Biden needs to reckon with his past and because, you know, he's still like he is still um, standing by some of the things that he did in the past that were not right. Yeah, that's one of the things that we mentioned about Kamala Harris. Like, don't pretend like you're perfect. Yes. Focus on growth. Mm -hmm. growth not perfection mm -hmm. uh and so that's kind of what i would like to you know see from her you know of course like if she was the nominee you know i would support her uh but i don't want anybody out here pretending like they're perfect uh yes. i want some growth yes that is my biggest thing and i think um on one instance it seems like uh i feel like biden and and sanders came in mm, i'm gonna say a little cocky in a way like i feel like mm -hmm. they just knew they were the top and they didn't have to do too much of their research because they, they they didn't really get on anybody else too well. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Everybody, they were able to attack and critique Biden and Sanders. Um, so I think they kind of underestimated the competition a little bit. And I think Harris definitely took advantage of that. Yeah. And so what I would like to see is because you're right, Harris did point the finger and talk about a lot of Biden's history. Now I would like to see Biden do the same to Harris, you know, <laughs> because I do want to see how she responds to this on this national stage of some of the things that she did as a prosecutor. Um, and I think somebody will at some point is going to have to bring that up about her and she's going to have to respond yeah. to that. But also with Harris, which was interesting too, because we talked about who raised their hands before um, about the question of, of <laughs> universal health care. She was one of the raise her hands, but mm -hmm. then a month ago she said, you know, she, in a report, um, she said she didn't support it. And then, so she was quickly called out on that. And then when asked about it, she said that she misunderstood the question. Question. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, uh, 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 I don't know how I feel about that one, <laughs> Senator it's, Harris. Cause it's kind of like, we, so many millions of people saw you raise your hand. How many people are going to get the information after the fact that like, oh, no, I'm not actually for abolishing, you know, private insurance. I was just talking about I was willing to have Medicare for myself. So it's just kind of like not a lot of people will get the correction, but a lot of people got, you know, her raising her hand. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So that that was kind of weird. I did like uh just in general, people were going in on Biden and Sanders. Eric Swalwell, when he was like, pass the torch. Yo, that was the, the quotable. Torch. <laughs> I mean, I I can't, you know, we trying to get these millennials in office. <laughs> yeah, that was so clever. I mean, because he was using Biden's words against him when Biden was coming up. Yes. You know, uh, for those of you not sure, so Joe Biden, when he was coming up, was telling the kind of old heads to pass the torch, give it to him, let the new generation run. And so that's exactly what he was doing. He was like, listen, Biden, uh, it's time for y'all to pass the torch and give remember it to the next generation. Told, remember when you said this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, that is so clever. Not sure how far to take him, but I mean, he raises a good point, right, to, to both Bernie and Biden, um, you know, they're both up there in age and, you know, the, the, you know, the typical, you know, old white men. And so mm -hmm. I think people who begin to address that, you know, will start to see how they approach that issue because, uh, Bernie, you're not the only one that can promote these kind of things, right? Uh, a younger person can. And would you throw your support behind them 
um, which you didn't do with Hillary, right, in the past, mm-hmm. which was the issue. And so if, if you don't win and somebody else does, can you be like, go ahead and support that person? Yeah. But but I would give Bernie his credit because a lot of the topics in both debates stem from what he did last time around. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of the major talking points. Yeah. That's what they said. Winners. Uh, and then they named like some the people that won. Uh, and they were like the other winner was Bernie's ideas. But Bernie yeah. did not win when yeah. his ideas did. <laughs> yeah, Bernie did not win. I don't know. He's the, him and Biden just didn't look too good up there, man. Um, they had the center, you know, center stage in the middle and supposed to hold it down. But they were not. They did not. uh hold up to what they were supposed to do. Now, uh, now there were a couple other people in that second debate that were quite interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, I guess, Marianne Williamson, man. Oh, my goodness gracious. She had me rolling. Because every time they asked her what you would do in office, she talking about she's going to pick up the phone and call some different country. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to call New Zealand. I'm going to call NATO. I'm going to call. I'm like, what does that have to do with America and the policies we try to do? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was so funny. She was like, all oh, y'all got plans, but we need slogans. <laughs> yes. That's what she said. She said, that's what uh, Trump won off Make America Great Again. And we need to have our own slogan. I was like, all right. But OK, so she out there. But there is some tr- some truth to what she said. We yeah, know Trump sure. ain't had no plans. But when you give voters something to hold on to, make America great again, they don't have to know what it is. You know, uh, what's that uh, song with Jay-Z? Um and uh, Kanye West was like, got my N word in Paris, and we go in gorillas. Yeah. And like, Will Ferrell was like, what does that mean? Nobody knows what it means. It, it gets <laughs> it's you going. Yeah, it's provocative. <laughs> it gets you going. And yeah, I don't, I'm not saying I would ever vote for her, but it is some truth. Hillary Clinton did not give voters something to latch on to. Yeah. And so I feel like. If like, for instance, somebody like Warren, who does have plans, if she could come up with a really good slogan, but also have the plans, I think that could work. So, I mean, she did have a point, but she just I- interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, of course, you want some a message that people can attach, attach yourself to. But that is not, you know, <laughs> need more than that to. To, just because Trump got away, if it does not mean we want to see this again on the left side, yeah. you know, have some policy, <laughs> have some ideas. And that's exactly what I've been saying with like a lot of. So we've been hearing people Medicare for all, abolish all your debt, do this, do that. And it's just kind of like, do not sell me a wall. I don't want to be like Trump supporters who are like, oh, you tell me you're going to do this like grand thing. And there's politically no way to get it done. Mm -hmm. Financially, no way to get it done. Like a judge just ruled that Trump can't even use that two point five billion dollars to even like go toward the wall. So for me, it's just kind of like, don't sell me a wall. Give me some plans that are going to, you know, make my life a little bit better, make the lives of my children better and let's continue to progress. But I don't want a wall. Yeah, exactly. Let's figure that out. Um, and, you know, I think uh, before we get because you mentioned a couple of policy ideas I want to talk about as well. Uh, before we quickly get to that, I do want people to note that, like I was reading these articles you know, they said, you know, Kamala kind of went up in the polls. They said Biden slipped a little bit, but they're also saying there was a fair share of uh, trolls, uh, trolls in the polls, if you will, um, that pretty much there are people who were uh, largely a lot of people who are Republican and Trump supporters went to the polls um, through various social media outlets. There was like this promotion to like uh, vote for in the polls. The, the 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 lower candidates, right? People mm-hmm. like Yang and Gabbard and um, somebody else. Uh, so their numbers were like spiking up, and people were like, "What's going on?" They didn't even do that well, but a lot of it was just you know a lot of Trump supporters going in and voting for people that and like Bill De Blasio and stuff like that yeah. that they would rather have see win or get up and, and kind of shake stuff up a little bit more. We and I'm just gonna say like people. Are learning from the last election in a negative way um, because we cannot depend on these polls because like 
Ty just said there are going to be trolls in there. There was actually a GOP strategist, Jeff Rowe, actually tweeted out to his 16,000 followers asking them to donate at least one dollar to keep Marion Williamson in the race. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people took them up on that. So it's just kind of like the, you know, the other side has a vested interest in make turning this into a circus rather than it being like serious because the more people we have in there the less time we actually have to hear plans to like really you know decide so it's just kind of like y'all you know there's some you know counter uh operations uh kind of going on Mm -hmm. out there Mm -hmm. speaking of that also did you see uh so we we critique kamala harris that's mm-hmm. our own. But did you see that there was like this concerted effort after the fact to sow like seeds of division? Um, mm-hmm. Donald Trump Jr. tweeted, uh, retweeted uh, this post that was like Kamala Harris is not an American black. She's Jamaican and Indian, Um, you know, saying like why she, you know, acting like she had this experience. And he retweeted that and come to find out that tweet not retweeted but that original tweet was tweeted at the same time by like a bunch of different accounts Mm. so it the exact wording of it was tweeted from multiple accounts at the same time so (laughs) that was like a concerted effort to kind of get that out there because you know there's this african descendant of slaves movement to where america african americans are trying to like, you know, stake their, you know, claim and like be seen as like a political group. And so there are people out there that are trying to like capitalize on that to say like, oh, she's not your type of black. So it's like, don't fall for stuff like that. Yeah. Even Cory Booker came out and defended her. It was pretty much his exact words. Just, you don't have to prove shit, you know, <laughs> um, which which is good. He had tweeted that because, uh, yeah, I mean, people are coming to attack her blackness. And again, that's something that shouldn't even be in question mm-hmm. um, at all. And doesn't weigh whether or not she makes her a good candidate or not. Right. It's the policies and what she's trying to promote in her narrative. Uh, but yes, this is so this I'm glad you brought that up, because, again, last time we had the issues when we figured out, oh, was Russia involved in collusion and all this stuff. But now you bet your bottom dollar that the Republicans are going to want to make this as confusing. Like you said, make it a circus as much as possible anyway, raise doubt on the top candidates, put up candidates who shouldn't be there up there and just raise all kind of confusion. So we just have to keep our, you know, keep our eyes and ears open and not fall for a lot of the traps they're trying to put out for us. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing, I don't know if you saw this, people tried to accuse Kamala Harris of lying about the the busing story. Um, They put out an article that was like, Kamala lied about busing and they used the yearbook picture uh, of the high school in Berkeley to say like, look, you know, when she started school, the school district was already uh, desegregated. Like she didn't, you know, experience busing. You know, the the lie detector test determined that that was a lie. She really did. Only the high school was integrated. And that's because they only had one high school. She was indeed the second class that was bused at the lower levels to, you know, integrate the school system, the school district or the city has come out to confirm what she said. So if you come across an article that says Kamala was lying and you see this yearbook as evidence, yes, the high school was integrated, but she did not lie. She really was a part of that second class. That Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because people, again, we live in this culture where people just, hear the first the first thing it reaches the most people and then that's what they run with and then a lot of people aren't going to go back and do their research to see if it was true or not you know mm-hmm. or see what comes afterwards that first headline that catches oh she lied we saw the yearbook picture now how many people are running with that even though it's false right yeah yeah uh, so yeah so we've got to be careful in this you know day and age folks uh because the conservative media and everyone will just even the liberal media they're going to spin certain narratives certain stories out there um, they have connections and networking can put things out there that are, that are start confusing us. So we got to just do our diligence and make sure, you know, we kind of research most of the things we, we hear. Otherwise, we'll get caught in the game. Yes. Do um, your research. And, you know, this is what Daphne and I hear as well to, to things that we find out. Definitely share with you all, too, to 
to, to help out in that in that progress. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, too, so uh, as I kind of talked to Daphne a little bit off air, uh, is that so we talked, you know, some of the major talking points for the debates have been things like healthcare and, of course, student loan debt. And so last week I put on, on my Instagram a post, Twitter and Instagram, but really I put it on my Instagram um, about uh, loan forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Right? And I pretty much said that I feel that although I feel like loan forgiveness is important, I also feel like it is a privileged problem in a lot of ways, right? I feel like it's definitely for people who are privileged enough to go to college, people who have these loans or um, a middle cl- more of a middle class issue than anything. Mm-hmm. And I was like, if Bernie is trying to take, if he can gather $1.6 trillion, my question was, should um, these should should student loans be a priority, or should that money be used or utilized to give back to poor communities of color or poor communities in general first as a priority? Mm-hmm. And even though that benefits people like myself and a lot of my peer groups and friends, which I would love to see that happen, should, should we be like yes automatically to all those to all the monies being um, gathered for such an issue? Um, and boy, oh boy, when I tell you people was in my DMs that Ryan, you up, how dare you? Right, it be up, like, I don't get it. Uh, you know, how's this going to actually help people? Uh, and again, it was, and I'm going to be honest, it was people of color who had, who have college degrees, who have student loans from this like kind of privileged group who were in my DMs trying to go in on me about what I was just suggested. <laughs> uh, and that really, you know, I was just laughing, but I was actually, you know, I kind of expected a little bit, but I wasn't sure. So I kind of threw the bait out there and a lot of people bit. And um, it just, it was very surprising the fact that I'm like, wow, like because this benefits us so much that you can't even really take the step back and be like, well, maybe we shouldn't get it first, right? Because I think we're constantly thinking of all the loan payments we have and stuff like that, which again, I I would love, but all I was doing is taking a step back and saying, listen, and and what I and my response to a lot of the people too, because I follow them on social media is like, listen, even though this will help, y'all are still living your lives just fine. Mm-hmm. You're buying homes, you having families, you're going on vacations, all this kind of stuff. And y'all can't lie to me because I see it all on your Instagram pages. Um with with student loans, right? So you're not in that desperate, dire need that we like to imagine ourselves to be. Um, so do we really need it where there are communities who don't even know where they're going to get their next meal, who who are not going to school, who all these issues, right? Mental health, whatever it is that we talk about that I think need the funds way before we do. Um, and and the, surprisingly, and, the, and I'll let you be, the dominant narrative from a lot of them was like, oh, well, if we do well, then we can help these communities. Uh, I'm like, the trickle, oh. down. <laughs> the trickle down. And I'm like, yo, that's not going to work. It's a lie. I can't believe you believe in that. And it was just a lot of long back and forth with a bunch of people um, who were going, I was like, oh, okay. I was like, and at the end of it, you know, we pieced it up. But I was like, I just want to let y'all know that y'all are giving me some good material for my podcast. So I'm going to bring this up um, and to talk about, to see what everybody else thinks about it. But anyway, uh, what, what are your thoughts about what? <laughs> What what happened on my social media? Uh, I think it's interesting. I feel like it just reflects the fact that at the end of the day, everybody is trying to get what they can get and what's out for them. And it's kind of like it's one of those things like don't take from me to, you know, try to fix this problem, especially if like somebody has come up with a solution for me. And like you said, I do feel like that is coming from a pr- place of privilege because, yo, I do you know, want these loans paid off. But what what would that do for me? That would just that would literally just like raise an already high standard of living. You get what I'm saying? It would just take me from like, you know, I you know what I'm saying? A lot of us that have these PhDs, have these doctorates, we are not at the bottom. So we we wouldn't it wouldn't even be like started from the bottom. Now we here. It would be like Mm -hmm. at minimum, like started from the median. Now we're in a Top seventy-five <laughs> at yeah. minimum. Yeah, and so you know, I think with a lot of the progressive ideas that are out there, I do think we have to ask ourselves some tough, tough questions about what we're willing to sacrifice to improve the lives of, you know, other people. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, 
Um, like the student loan thing, that doesn't bother me because even with Warren's plan, like I said, wouldn't even be eligible, but it's something I support because it would yeah. help other people out. But, you know, when they ask that question about private, like giving up private insurance for other people to have it, I won't lie. It was just kind of like, I, I don't know about all that. You know mm-hmm, what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's from a place of privilege. I've never been without insurance. I've always been able to go to the doctor when I want to see whatever doctor I want to. Uh, when I had students in insurance and I was forced to go to the student health, I was so indignant. I was like, no, I want to be able to choose my doctor. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So like me being like kind of, I don't know, scared or, you know, not 100% gung-ho about like giving up my private insurance. That's from a place of privilege because I've always had it. Yeah. And you know, that's something that I'm dealing with because I'm not going to say I've re- resolved that. Like, I want some candidates to answer some questions to me about what is that going to mean for my quality of care? Because at the end of the day, I am a black person and we already have, you know, more negative outcomes than other people. I don't want to go from great coverage to OK coverage. So it's kind of like those are some questions that I have for candidates that I want to see answered. Like, what is this going to mean for my standard of care? Because I ain't going to pretend like my standard of care is already 100 percent, but I I'm decently satisfied with it. But I'm not going to I'm not willing to like regress either. So, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. So I think, you know, that was really eye opening to me because, you know, even though me and a lot of my colleagues, my friends, black friends who have all these degrees and we preach a lot of the things we would like to see and help our communities. But it's a tough question to be like, okay, well, when it doesn't benefit us directly or at all, but is a greater good for the community, are you willing to bypass that? Use that 1.6 trillion for the people that need it more than you, right? Mm-hmm. And just like you, you know, I'm I'm by no means up here saying that I know everything and I'm completely for like just saving the world, you know, with everything. <laughs> um there are some personal things like yes, the loan issue, I am definitely more likely to be like, yeah, go ahead. I don't need this money. Give it to everybody else, right? Cuz I'm good. It's not going to not I'm still going to live my life the way I would like to live it. It'll be paid off eventually um, because I have that privilege. But yes, when it comes to that healthcare stuff, I'm like, oh boy, uh, like, uh, I need some more. And, and it's like, not that I'm against it, but like you said, I just need a lot more questions answered um, about it because there's no way you can go from what we have now to just completely universal and it benefiting everyone fairly. And mm. the way this country has operated, you can't even, I'm not even going to say and fool myself, just not even speaking from a place of privilege, but even if I was in some of the most disadvantaged positions, that that I would still be getting treated fairly with this universal health care. Government run. Government <laughs> run. I just wouldn't trust it. But like you said, from a personal perspective, you know, my, my private plan is amazing. Right. I'm, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm on a state plan and it is just like, I mean, it is phenomenal T- things that, you know, since I've been teaching uh, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> will this like you like, will this universal plan be worse than what I have now? Uh, so, I, you know, this is not and I understand the need of having um, uh, it available for most people. And, you know, I'm more of like, can I keep what I have, raise my taxes so people so people can get it for free? Yeah. You know, like, I'll, you know, whatever it is, but can I at least have the option to keep mine is where I'm kind of at. Honestly, you know, just full transparency. Um, and, I just, and again, it's not that I would never not be for it. It's just that for me, it's just and, I, and I'm thinking not even just for myself. I'm thinking of like me, you know, my wife, the family I plan on having and all of us benefiting from this really good health care. And if it completely changing and we're, we're worse off now. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's a lot to it. Um, but. You know, am I right or wrong? I don't know, but that's just how I feel about that. And so it's just, you know, just deeper questions. It's a that's a tough pill for me to swallow at this moment. Yeah, yeah, I I feel you. <laughs> uh, but that I think it was uh, Gillibrand who talked about like actually having a plan to move from you know private to like having a public option uh, for people, and then you know eventually people might see, you know, have a chance to buy into uh, being like a fully like public system. And, you know, some people say like incremental change, you know, doesn't work, but I, I, I don't know. I might want to see some incremental stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to lie. I'm not going to sit up here in front and, you know, pretend no. like I'm just, you know, gung- With the- I could be, 
if people actually answer questions about how it's going to work, I'm a detailed person. If you just be like Medicare for all and I don't have no details about how this going to work, I'm not going to buy into it. I, yes. I, that's just who I am as a person. Yes. The step by step process. I mean, even with everything is important, even with loans getting paid back is important. And I think that's a big thing, because even when Bernie answers those questions, like, how are you going to do that? And he says, well, everybody's going to get together. I'm going to we're going to protest. and It's going to be revolution, you know, ground up. Like, Bernie, that is not answer how are you going to make Medicare for all <laughs> by just saying everybody's going to go in the streets and protest like we've done in the past to get what we want. No, that's that's not good enough, bro. Yeah. Um, and so but that's that's his usual response when he gets asked that directly. It's like, what is your direct plan to this? Um, and he's came up with, you know, gathering the one point six trillion or whatever for student loans. But this whole Medicare thing is not uh, he's not doing well with that. So yep. good idea on surface. But. Again, if it's not done correctly, not and and the, the bottom line is this: even if it's not done correctly, I'm pretty certain that people like you and I, that people who are in privileged positions, will still find a way to be taken care of. Yeah. And those who are not in these positions will probably can be even in worse decisions, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, because we have the, the the capacity to make sure in some way that we'll be find a way to be good for us and our families. Um, so not even just scary for us, but already scary for those who don't have, if not done correctly, can be. Mm-hmm. Very much more detrimental to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, that was good. Um, I guess a couple, uh, one more thing we can talk about before heading out, kind of going along the politics, is uh, Supreme Court stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, decisions that have been made recently. And again, it's funny because, you know, we talked about this either one or two episodes ago, ago when I discussed, you know, Kavanaugh and how he was getting a lot of playing the news for decisions he was making, which were wide decisions. But I said, let's pay attention to what he does with those close decisions. Close decisions, yeah. And um, one of the ones, you know, the one you sent me was uh, a recent decision on gerrymandering, Mm -hmm. which is a five to four majority decision, um, pretty much saying that they're going to continue to allow it. Um, like and- extreme gerrymandering, which makes it difficult for your voice to be heard. Uh, and so that's what somebody had a meme. It was just kind of like, oh, this is a political uh, issue. Uh, people will vote uh, their representatives out if they don't like what they're doing. Well, they literally can't do that with extreme gerrymandering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can't. Because as they always keep office uh, relining, redistricting, whatever, um you know, congressional districts and stuff like that. And all of a sudden we were trying to take the house back and stuff like that. And you realize, why can't we get these people out? It's because how they drew them districts. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in some cases, right, I think maybe in places like North Carolina, wherever, where there's predominantly like black colleges or black students, they like gerrymander it where they're, they're not included in that district. Um, mm-hmm. If it's a conservative district, right? So these kids can vote all they want, even though it's a, a down the street or a block away where that uh, congressional lines are, they can't get that person out because their lines don't, their votes don't count um, uh, for that constituency. Um, so they pretty much ruled in favor to allow it. Um, and so I think a lot of districts were, they were doing it, some extreme, but some were kind of skeptical, but now opens the door for them to go, to go ham. Yeah. Uh, but people are like, oh, this can help the liberals too, you know? Uh, uh, yes, it will. Cause I'm sure they'll do it as well. But I think the difference is middle America, um, where it makes such a, a very, a very much, uh, stronger impact as is mm. in places where there's not a lot of black and brown folk. Uh, and you're doing things like this, it's just going to continuously keep some some people in office that maybe shouldn't be there in both ways. Mm-hmm. And then I think there was another, um, again, uh, Supreme Court ruling had to do with the census. Trying yeah. To put the citizenship question on yeah. there. Yeah, they did block that one. <laughs> yeah, they did block. It was a 5-4 majority, again, went to, you know, most of the liberals and stuff like that voted. But, you know, it was Kavanaugh and Thomas and, and Gersich and all those people who were in the dissenting vote. Um, of trying to get the citizenship question on there as well. So, so again, just pay attention to the patterns, folk. Don't get fooled. Kavanaugh is who he is, and Trump put him there for a reason. And we're seeing in these situations that he's not, you know, being this uh, middle centrist person that uh, people think think he may be. Yeah, what's interesting um, is I read an article that said that Trump 
is wants to try to delay the census just so that he can have a chance to because I think it was knocked back down to like the lower courts or something like mm-hmm. that wants a chance to like try to appeal it to still get it on there and the census and I think in it's like 200 year history or however level however long it has never been delayed it has yeah. never been late um but he's gonna try it <laughs> yeah, man just let the census come out on time man your question ain't making it you know one question you're trying to f- go this whole immigration campaign and um i don't even know why people would int- uh, you know put that uh answer that question truthfully i know i sure would it's not yeah. with trump in office yeah if i, if I wasn't uh, a citizen or whatever you know there's no blowback from from lying on those things so i'm not gonna be like oh yeah trump come get me you know whatever but um so yeah pay attention to that stuff folks uh anything else staff we forgetting or no i think this was this was you know pretty good and the next debates will be a month from now or at the okay. end of july so right. uh, we'll probably you know come back on and see if we see anything different we'll see <laughs> yep yep sure there'll be a lot of conversation between now and then but definitely keep our eyes open for that next debate and have another conversation is what changed? What were different? I know some people are going to come back with a better game plan, especially I'm sure people like Beto and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Maybe have maybe have a stronger showing. But I'm always interested to see, you know, the type of questions that are and the topics that are discussed um, in these debates because they try to make it a little different every time. Um, all right, Linda, if you haven't already, follow us on social media at BHD Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Visit our website, blackandhighlydangerous.com, to keep up with all our latest content. Um, if you want to be on the podcast, if you have ideas, questions, comments, you can always email us at bhdpodcast at gmail.com. Um, you, know, you know, people always hit us up about interviews or topics and questions and or, um, just ideas, whatever it is, hit us up. And we definitely um, uh, enjoy that and interact with you guys in that way. Um, if you haven't yet, review and rate us on iTunes. Again, that's very, very helpful for us. So please, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, which plenty of you are, just go on iTunes. If you listen to iTunes, uh, drop that five-star rating, write a review, tell us why you like it, why you enjoy it. Um, and that really helps us out. And after you do that, go ahead and share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.